Hey, everybody. How do you do this? Let the people come in. Let the people come in. You guys see me out there? Let me know if you see me. Okay. All right. Let me do this. One second. All right, guys. All right. One second, folks. Let everybody come in. And it is Black History Month, folks. I'm putting a comment in here. One second, guys. So good to be back with you. All right. Okay. All right. Set up your headline. Ian Burroughs. All right, Ian, where am I going to, where, where do I do that, Ian? It says set up my headlines. We're going to get to that later. Tonight's topic, we're going to talk about uh, the beginning of Black History Month, of course. But I'm going to let folks come in here. I see Luther Smith. Who else is coming in? Okay, there's Ian. All right, folks, I'm not getting started till I see some hearts, some thumbs up. You know, that's what gets me going. I get to get into it. TC Mahfoud, there she is. Brock Jeffries. Mike uh, Codjo. Okay, I see some thumbs up finally. Yes. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. You know, I always try to bring some good information. I know, brother. I, Ian, I was supposed to call you first. I know, brother. We'll, we'll get it next time. I'm sorry. It's snowing here. It's freezing. Uh, I'm running around trying to get stuff done. All right. All right. I'm going to get started. It's your good brother, Abdul Rahman Muhammad, from the Emmy-nominated docuseries, Who Killed Malcolm X?, and we're here today to celebrate the beginning of Black History Month. Vinny Brito, what's going on, brother? Homeboy. Beginning of Black History Month. And um, I had planned on talking about the founder of Black History Month, Dr. Carter G. Woodson. That is a name that we should all know and be uh, 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 acquainted with and familiar with because the man's impact on black history and culture has been enormous. Dr. Carter G. Woodson, the founder of what was then Negro History Week. And uh, you know, as the, as the joke goes, you know, now it's a month Black History Month, and they said, well, they gave us the month with the shortest days, only 28 days. <laughs> well, you have to kind of thank uh, Dr. Carter for that, Carter G. Woodson. Uh, he chose February, the second week in February, as Negro History Week because um, it celebrated the birthday of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. 
Okay, both of them were born in uh, February. Fre Frederick Douglass was born on February 14th. Abraham Lincoln was born on February 12th. And so that's the reason why he selected the second week in February for Negro History Week, which by the 1970s had become Black History Month, okay? It is said uh, that the first group of people to celebrate it as an entire month was some students and some faculty and educators at Kent State. Uh, it was first proposed in 1969. 1970 is when the first Black History Month was celebrated at Kent State from uh, January 2nd to February 28th, 1970. Again, President Gerald Ford um, in 1976 at the Bicentennial, he recognized it as a month and we have been celebrating it as a full month uh, ever since then. The idea uh, that Dr. Woodson had was that, you know, we would celebrate black history and culture the entire year. The month of February was only meant to be like a review of what we had been studying the entire year. So Black History Month is really supposed to be an entire year, ladies and gentlemen, okay? We should be celebrating our history every single day because we're making history every single day, okay? And we have made history and contributions to this country, talking about black folks ever since day one. And in reality, black history is really just another element of American history, okay? And that was Dr. Woodson's vision. However, I'm not going to talk about his life tonight because there's been some new news in the Malcolm Scholarship that I wanted to bring to you. Okay, you guys know, you know you love Malcolm X. Anything to do with Malcolm X, you guys are here for it, right? Give me some hearts. Give me some thumbs up. You guys are here for anything new related to Malcolm X. You came here to this channel, you saw for the first time the face of Wilbur X. McKinley, one of the five assassins who created the disturbance, the misdirection in the back. Nigga, get your hand out my pocket. Stood up and threw the smoke bomb down. For the first time, you saw his face here on Facebook, uh, my Facebook page. Okay, we made history. For the first time in history, most of you all saw the face of William X. Bradley, the shotgun assassin, in Who Killed Malcolm X. Even though I published this picture almost a decade earlier, for the first time you saw him last year in Who Killed Malcolm X, still on Netflix. It will be on Netflix another whole year, ladies and gentlemen. If you missed it, go back and watch it. So I know you guys are, and I've got some Malcolm X scholars here. I have a lot of scholars in my audience, some sharp people. You guys keep me on my toes. But just recently, I was preparing for Black History Month, okay? And I was going to talk about certain uh, personalities who contributed to the, um, the, the popularity of black history, the promotion of black history in America. Again, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, the founder of Negro History Week. Also, Arthur uh, Schomburg, okay, founder of the Schomburg Center in New York. I was going to talk about J.A. Rogers, but we got some news. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe it was Saturday. Saturday evening, I received a text on my messenger, okay, Facebook messenger, and it was an image of a book cover, and you saw the photograph, I, I posted it on Facebook, it was an image, a never before seen image of Louise Norton Little, the mother of Malcolm X. Who did I get the text from? The text was from 
one of Malcolm X's nieces. Sister's name is Sean. And um, I will not give you her last name. It will probably come out at some time. But she asked not to share her name because, um, you know, she doesn't really um, try to capitalize on her being the niece of Malcolm X. But if you'd like to know who her mother is, her mother is Malcolm X's sister, or was Malcolm X's sister, Yvonne Little, who became uh, Yvonne Jones, and then she got, she got married again. But if you'd like to see Malcolm's sister, Yvonne Little, you want to go to YouTube and pull up a documentary from the early 90s called Malcolm X, Make It Plain. And in there you will see Yvonne Little, Malcolm's youngest sister, the mother of the, of the woman that sent me this text sad, uh, Saturday night. Now, this was a bombshell, okay? And I'll tell you why. During this COVID year, I developed a course on the autobiography of Malcolm X, a classic text. And I think that I can say there's nothing like it available anywhere, even on the university level. All right? There's nothing like it. I poured close to 40 years of my study of this man's life into this course. It has two parts, okay? Let me tell you who's already taken the course. I've had a niece of the jazz genius, pianist Thelonious Monk, has taken the course. I've had a daughter of the African-American playwright and poet, Amiri Baraka, one of his daughters, Baraka's daughters, took the course. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. But... Uh, my greatest honor was to have in my course two of Malcolm's nieces, all right? Two of Malcolm's nieces, the daughters of Yvonne Little. However, I only knew of one of them. The other one, Sean, who was in another section of the class, she didn't tell me who she was. Okay, she, she's a married lady. She has, you know, a different surname. And she was very quiet, didn't say a lot, you know, didn't say a lot. Just sat to enjoy the course, right? At the end of the course, people had questions and comments and what have you. And she said, I'd like to say something. She said, I just want you to know that I wasn't spying on you or anything like that. I just didn't want to get in your way, but I am the niece of Malcolm X. She said, I just want you to know that this course was incredible. That <laughs> she said, your research is incredible, unbelievable. And I tell you what startled her. In this course, for the first time, I revealed with documentation the grandfather, the white grandfather of Malcolm X, the plantation owner who Malcolm says raped his grandmother. Okay? And I showed uh, the, the documentation and, and the evidence. Okay? Now, Unbeknownst to me, this book that I saw Saturday night that Sean sent me, this book was already being worked on, okay? It took about 10 years, close to 10 years, to write this book. And it's being done by a young lady in England, a woman named Jessica Russell, okay? White lady. She did this book out of a labor of love in collaboration with Malcolm's last living sibling, his sister Hilda, who just passed away in 2015 at the age of 93. Can you believe that? 
Can you believe that? Sister was born in 1922. Well, we just lost Cicely Tyson, right? Cicely Tyson was born in uh, 1924. Okay? So, this is the beautiful... A lot of questions. Whatever became of Malcolm's mother? This was the question, right? So, Sean was sitting in my class, and she was like, does he know about the book? Because of the material that I was sharing, how could someone who's not in the family know this information, right? So she called her other sister, who was in the other section of my class, her sister Deborah. Does he know about the book? How does he know all this stuff, Deb? He must know. And Deborah said, no, he doesn't know. Well, he is a researcher, you know. He, I, okay. So what do you think my reaction was? I said, bing, I look on my phone, and there it is, this book, The Life of Louise Norton Little by Jessica Russell and Hilda Little, who never married and never had children, by the way, and Malcolm's nephew, y Yvonne's now deceased son, late son, uh, Stephen Jones. Okay, He was like the family historian there in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Louise Little lived for 94 years, 93 years, 93, 94 years, okay, 1897, and she died in 1989. Can you believe that? Why don't we know more about her? Why don't, in fact, we know more about the little family? All of these characters that are mentioned, in the autobiography that looms so large that we've been reading about for close to 60 years now. Sister Hilda, can you imagine if she tried to capitalize on her brother's name? Yes, I'm the older sister of Malcolm X. Keep in mind, if you recall from the autobiography, it is his sister Hilda who joined the Nation of Islam before him and was working the hardest on him to bring him in, she actually visited Malcolm in prison, the Norfolk prison colony, and taught him Yaqub's history. <laughs> taught him the theology of the nation of Islam, the grafting of the white race, and, um, you know, the ancient history of the tribe of Shabazz and all that. His sister Hilda taught him that. Can you just imagine if she decided to go on the speaking circuit and stack up those Benjamins talking about this history, but she never tried to exploit her relationship with her brother. In fact, she was a very, very private woman. And indeed, the entire little family is very, very private. So we really don't know what his brother Wesley did in life, his brother Reginald, his brother, his youngest brother, Robert, who they call, who was Uncle Butch, okay? We just don't know because they decided to live very private lives. And from speaking with um, Deborah and Sean, you know, you see that they're just a, they're just a regular family, okay? They're just regular folk, just like our family. You know, even though this man, <laughs> who is a giant, I still, when I'm talking to these women on the phone, I still can't believe that they're talking about Uncle Malcolm. In fact, Deborah told me a story. The first time we spoke, the first time I spoke with Deborah Jones in Grand Rapids, daughter of, y uh, of Yvonne, she told me about the time that Malcolm visited their home. She told some funny stories. I hope she doesn't mind me telling this story. But um, she does remember when Malcolm was assassinated, and she remembers when Malcolm used to visit their home. Her mother was the first African-American operator in the Michigan Bell system. Okay, She was the first black operator. In those days, when you wanted to connect long-distance calls and whatever, you had to have an operator. 
to actually physically connect the lines. All right. So this is a good job she had. She's trying to raise her family. And Malcolm's out there making these incendiary comments and preachments. And he's condemning the entire white race. And she has to try to protect her family, you know, from what he's saying. To keep his life separate from her. She's a married lady trying to raise her family, whatever. So whenever Malcolm, Deborah told me, whenever he would visit the house, she couldn't have any friends around. Okay? Just the family. Malcolm would show up with a driver. He'd come, get out the car. He had that big smile on his face. And she told the story of when her brother was selling little boy, he was selling um, cookies, like a fundraiser. You know how you sell bo uh, Boy Scout cookies? Well, he was selling cookies for the YMCA, Young Men's Christian Association, right? Okay, Malcolm's a black Muslim, okay? So Malcolm gets out the car, picture this, picture this, because Yvonne is over here, she's protecting her family, okay? Malcolm's here, okay? Great, so her brother, but still... She's got to keep her eyes open. Malcolm gets out the car. Uncle Malcolm, Uncle Malcolm, you want to buy some cookies? You want to buy some cookies, Uncle Malcolm? Malcolm looks down at the box, right? He's YMCA. He says, um, "Sure, Steve. What do you what do you sell? What do you, what do you uh, what are you selling that for? You know, Yvonne's looking. She said, "Now, Malcolm." He don't know anything about that because Malcolm doesn't want to spend his money to support this Christian organization. <laughs> she said, now he doesn't know anything about that, Malcolm. Now, if you're going to buy some cookies, buy some cookies from the boy, but don't get him involved in all that. He, he just selling cookies, okay? <laughs> so Malcolm said, here, here's some money. I don't, want, I don't need to buy the cookies, but here, here's a little money for you, Baba Bull, okay? Stories like that, Okay? This book has been worked on this book. They've been working on this book for the last close to 10 years. And it's finally here. And I posted it on Facebook. And the beautiful thing about it is right now it's available for free on Kindle. Because Kindle has a special going on right now for one month. You can download the app and you can download the, uh, the books for free for one month but i want you to buy the book because first of all i want you to have it in your collection but also 25 percent of the proceeds of the book are going to a charity in the name of louise norton little all right so now with that let me talk about i want to use louise's life to talk about Black History Month, because now I want to transition into talking about our people, all right? Talking about our people. Now, you know, brothers and sisters, do you know that right now there's actually something of a debate in certain segments or certain circles or certain quarters of the African-American community about who falls under that definition of our people? Yes, there is a debate going on in the, in the black community. It's who is actually a black American, a true black American? Can you believe it? You may hear, for example, you remember when Ice Cube got into a little trouble a couple of months ago, okay, for uh, speaking with the former administration and what have you. And he said in his interviews that he developed this program in support of ADOS. Do you remember he said that? ADOS? ADOS stands for American Descendants of Slaves. Okay, you may have heard this. Now, there's another school of thought, kind of the same concept. They call it 
foundational black Americans. What do they mean by this? What does Cube mean by this? Because what I want to do tonight is I want to unpack this concept. All right? I want to unpack it. And I want to show that th that uh, it's wrong. And it's ahistorical. All right? I don't want to attack anyone. I don't want to name any names. I don't want to talk about who formulated these ideas. Okay? But these ideas, what they really want to argue is this. They're saying that, look, unless... Unless you are descended from chattel slavery, then you are really not a foundational black American. You're an immigrant. Okay? You're an immigrant. Now, why, why are they making this case? Why are they developing this concept? Where is this coming from? Okay? To where we're going to now start dividing up black people in America. Pitting uh, so-called ADOS or Afri American descendants of slaves against black immigrants. As if we're going to have some type of intra-racial xenophobia. Which we have never had in black America. Black folks have never acted like that. We never had a movement, let's say, like the Know Nothings in the 19th century. Go look that up. Okay, there was a group in the middle of the 19th century. They were absolutely hostile to immigrants, to Catholics, right, to all kind of foreigners. They were called the Know Nothings. Because if you ask them, what, did they believe these kind of things? They say, I don't know nothing. I know nothing. I, okay, the Know Nothings anti-immigration group, xenophobic group in the 19th century, all right? We black folk have never had any type of xenophobia against other blacks from other countries, okay? In fact, what I'm going to argue tonight is that <clears throat> this construct of ADOS or the other formulation foundational black Americans, okay, is a historical, it's not rooted in history, the historical facts argue against it, it's harmful, it's divisive, okay, and we need to, we need to unpack it, and let's, let's, let's get, let's get away from this, okay, let's, 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 you know, let's, um, let's get rid of this concept, that's my argument. Okay. Now, here's where here's where it came. Here's why it came up. Here's where this comes from. It relates back to reparations. Okay. Reparations. It related back to how Black Americans were tricked by <clears throat> the civil rights legislation. Rather than clearly define the gains of the civil rights era as specifically for black Americans, the federal government started using terms like people of color, minorities, okay? All of these vague terms which allowed other immigrant groups like Indians, like Arabs, like, you know, you name it, okay? Even, even yes, some other Africans who don't identify with African Americans, West Indians, to benefit from the, the gains of the civil rights struggle, okay? As if to say, you know, we put our bodies on the line, the fire hoses were turned against us. The dogs were sicked on us. We're the ones that went to jail to get this legislation passed. Okay? We're the ones that fought for affirmative action. And now here come all of these groups. And under minorities, you know who falls under minorities? White women. White women benefited from affirmative action more than anyone else. 
Okay? So you have some people that had some, I believe they had some good in, intentions, they had some good motives. And every so often, um, this issue comes up, especially around election time, the issue of reparations for slavery. Okay? That black folks should be made whole for the hundreds of years that they worked for free under slavery, under bondage, under racial oppression. Okay, that the United States government owes us for all that unpaid labor, for all of the institutional and personal wealth that it built, okay, and for all of the generational harm that it has done to us, that that system of oppression and slavery has done to us, all right? The government owes us, and it paid reparations to the Japanese for being interred in them camps, paid reparations to Jews, and other groups got reparations, and damn it, we're going to get our reparations. Cut the check. That's what, that's how, <laughs> that's how they... That's how they break it all down to the nitty gritty. Cut the check. Cut the check. We are old. All right. So then the question became, how are we, if reparations are to come, how are we to keep ourselves from being tricked again with all of this people of color language, all these minorities and, and you know, all these vague categories? We have to we have to define. Who can get that check? We have to define who can get it. Okay? You just can't be some, you know, you, you some Indian person of color. You're going to come get our reparations check. No. You can't just be some, you know, uh, uh, some Arab who just got here a few days ago talking about your minority. And you, you're going to get our reparation check. Like you got all those affirmative action slots. No. No. We're going to come up with a legal definition of who can get this reparations check. That's where all this came from, okay? And they boiled it down to chattel slavery. Whoever can, whoever can trace an ancestor, if you're a black person in America, and you can trace your ancestry back to someone in chattel slavery, then you qualify legally to get your check. You qualify legally to receive reparations because you were a product and a victim of American slavery. That's why they call it ADOS, American descendants of slaves, because Haitians were, you know, enslaved. They were enslaved by the French. Okay? Uh, Jamaicans were enslaved. They were enslaved by the British. So Jamaicans and Haitians and, you know, brothers and sisters from that back, they don't qualify. If their ancestors, their, their parents or their grandparents or their great-grandparents, whatever the case is, if they can't trace one ancestor, Back to chattel slavery, they don't qualify to get the check. Okay, now let's unpack this, and we have to unpack this because this is a very pernicious ideology. This is a dangerous ideology, and it's an ideology that a Malcolm X would have never subscribed to. Okay, impossible. Why? Because his own mother was a West Indian, all right? His own mother migrated here from Grenada, all right? And actually, she migrated to Canada, Montreal, Canada, in 1917, all right? That's where she met Earl Little. I know the autobiography says, Malcolm says his parents met in Philadelphia. They did not meet in Philadelphia. They met in Montreal at a Garvey meeting. Garvey was speaking. And uh, Earl, who was now a Garveyite, because he made it north during the Great Migration, he went all the way to Montreal to hear Garvey. And he walked in the room, and he, he saw this little cutie pie over there, man, and he was struck. 
if they dated two weeks, they dated a long time. It wasn't even two weeks, man. They was married. Earl put a ring on Louise's finger. Okay, that's how that happened. And then they moved back down into the States after they got married. And it's in Philadelphia where they had their oldest son, Wilford. Okay, Wilford Little. Philadelphia had a high uh, concentration of Garveyites. It was a, it was, you know, it was a Garvey um, epicenter so to speak, okay? It was a hotbed of Garveyism in Philadelphia. That was because there was a, a reverend there. His name was James Eason. And he converted his whole church, right, to the Garvey movement, all right? From there, they made their way to Omaha, Nebraska, okay? Omaha, Nebraska, where Hilda was born, his older sister Hilda, who helped with this book, all right? 1922, and then his brother Filbert in 1923, and then Malcolm was born in 1925. All right? One of the things we learn in this new book, which I'm going to do a review of sometime this month, is we really didn't know just how close the Littles were to Marcus Garvey. I found out in this book that Marcus Garvey used to actually visit the little home in Omaha, okay, which was saturated with Ku Klux Klan, okay? Omaha, Nebraska was Klan country. Nebraska itself had about 45,000 Klan members. There were Klan women's groups, Klan children's groups, Klan churches, okay? And here is Earl Little and Louise Little, who's soldiering right along beside him, just as militant and hardcore and committed to the Gavi message as her husband. And I know sometimes the autobiography makes it look like Earl is the big leader and Louise, no, no, no. They were a partnership. And she, she believed just as much as Earl. She was the secretary, secretary for the movement. All right, she, she wrote for the magazine, The Negro World. She filed the reports of the meetings. Her husband was the president of the Omaha branch. And then he would go off to Milwaukee and he would organize in Milwaukee. Okay? And they had a car. Think about this. In the 1920s, the Littles had an automobile. Okay? And so Earl would get in his automobile and he would go to Milwaukee and organize for the UNIA, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, preaching black pride, black progress, the love of Africa and the love of self, the love of your black skin. Okay? He was away preaching. And that's where the autobiography opens up, the chapter Nightmare. Nightmare. When the Klan, the Ku Klux Klan, raided Malcolm's house, came, seized, or, or pounced on the house, surrounding the house, terrorizing the house on horses and burning torches, right? And we see Louise Little pregnant with her son, Malcolm Little, the baby Malcolm. She comes to the door. And she lets the clan have it. Where's Earl? Where's he at? Bring him out. And she said, he's not here. He, she had that West Indian patois. And you should listen to Wilfred Little, her oldest son, because Wilfred at this time was six years old. Remember, Malcolm wasn't born yet. Okay, Malcolm wasn't born yet. Wilfred was six years older than Malcolm. So he had clear recollections of this. And he recounted it later. He said, I never heard someone get so, um, <laughs> get so angry and not use profanity. That her language was so refined. She could speak English. She could speak French. She could speak Patois. Okay? Highly educated lady. Very powerful with the language. Very, you know, uh, eloquent. And she let the clan have it. She wasn't cowering. She came to the door. What do you want? He's not here. Get out of here. Okay? 
She's standing in the door pregnant with the baby, pregnant with Malcolm. All right. And the clan, ter you know, they terrorized some more. They busted off some windows and they rode off. OK. Now, here's the point that I'm going to make here. Using the story of Louise Little. And tying it into the black identity, the black American identity, the African American identity. Racial oppression in America, it forges a common black identity. Okay? The claim, the claim that is made by these ADOS people, these foundational black American people, okay? That there's some, that at some point in American history, there was something called a pure black American culture. And then here come these immigrants, okay, mooching off of our games, right? That this is fictional. This is ahistorical. This is wrong. This is bad history. The truth of the matter is, that there has never been a time when black American culture in history was not a fusion or a blending of these two different elements. Okay. Those who you would call ADOS or maybe, you know, American descendants of slave and blacks from other places. It's always been that way from the very beginning and we never had any problem with it until now we've never had any division about this in the black community until now this ados here i hear ice cube talk about ados american descendants of slaves that's wrong that's wrong because when that clan when those clan when, when that clan raid was terrorizing that home and terrorizing Louise Little, Louise Little has suffered the same oppression, the same terror, the same fear as all other black people. Are you following me? Our culture has always been an assimilation of all different elements. Okay? And we all suffer together. Stop this nonsense. I've been watching this movement, this ADOS foundational black America thing for a few years now, and it's turned very nasty and very xenophobic and hateful against other blacks from other countries. Okay, it's very nasty. And it's something we've never seen before. And it all boils down to people believing that they're gonna get a reparations check from the government, okay? And their Jamaican brother or their Trinidadian brother or their Haitian brother and sister is going to try to get their check. This is ignorant. This is ignorant. I'm not attacking anyone who believes this. I know some of y'all believe this. I don't believe it. Malcolm X would never sign onto anything like this. The man was a consummate Pan-Africanist. To the bone and to the marrow. Do you understand me? Okay. Impossible that Malcolm could ever agree to some divisive movement like this. No way possible. Impossible. Okay. In fact, these ADOS people, they throw Malcolm X out of it. <laughs> they say he's not one of, quote, our people. So if you have any West Indian background, you're not our people. If one of your parents, like say for the, for example, the comedian Godfrey, right? Godfrey's parents is Nigerian. He's out of it. He can't get, you feel me? You, understand, you see where this thing is going? So Louise Little and Earl Little come together and they produce this beautiful family. And that family is us. That is the black American identity. It always has been, and it always will be. We're indigenous blacks, blacks from others, and then we blend. Right? Harriet Tubman becomes all of our hero. 
Frederick Douglass becomes all of our hero. Wherever we're from, if we're black in America, okay? That's, that's, that's always been the case. And we've never had any type of division and hatred against other blacks. And, and let me prove it to you. Let me prove to you that the whole thing is false. The whole thing is ahistorical, is not rooted in fact since day one. You can't develop some type of purity test. Who's a pure black American? Who's a pure ADOS, American descendant of slaves? Okay? Such that you know, anyone else, any other black from any other culture is an interloper. Interloping into our culture. No. Black American culture is all of us and it always has been. I'm going to prove it to you right now. You want to start picking people out of our history and, and try to huh, come up with some type of pure ADOS history and culture? Let's look. If you, by the time you start picking, you're going to have nothing left. You're going to have nothing left. Right? I mean, let's start with John Baptiste, Ponte de Sabo. The Sabo, huh? The founder of Chicago. All right. We all take pride in him, don't we? Chicago, one of the largest black populations in America, huh? He's regarded as the first permanent non indigenous settler of what would become Chicago. The Sabo. He's called the founder of Chicago. He's the founder of Chicago. You got a school named after him, a museum, a harbor, a park, a bridge. Every other thing is named after the Sabo. But he wouldn't qualify to be ADOS. He's not ADOS. He's not a product of American slavery. So we got to get rid of him. Throw him out. Yeah, throw him out. Either he was of a Haitian background or French Canadian. It really hasn't been settled yet, but what is settled is that he was not born here in the States and he was not an American slave. He's not Adolf. So what are we gonna say? He's not our people. He's not central to our history and our culture. What kind of insane movement is this? What kind of ignorant ahistorical movement is this? You, you have to be really, I mean, you, you, you really have to be ignorant to buy into this stuff, okay? The first, the first black college president, Charles L. Reason, 1818 to 1893, American mathematician, linguist, and educator, he was the first African-American college professor in the United States. He taught in New York, okay? His parents, his father was from Guadalupe. His mother was from San Domingue, from Haiti, okay? He went to school at the African Free School in New York. Do you know who his classmates were? His classmates, classmates was George T. Downing, okay? Who was the restaurateur for my state, Rhode Island? Who was an abolitionist who used his restaurants as stops on the Underground Railroad? And do you know who his other classmate was? Henry Highland Garnett, the abolitionist Presbyterian minister, fiery brother. Okay, Charles R. Reason, the first black college president, but he's not ADOS. He's not a product of American slavery. Oh, we got to get rid of him now. Okay? Do you see where this goes? Do you see where this goes? And his brother, Charles Reason's brother, Patrick Reason, was also an abolitionist because Reason was an abolitionist as well. He wasn't even a slave. He's not from here, but he was an abolitionist. This, this is what you find, right? Brothers and sisters who come from other places, they struggle with us. Stop with this nonsense. They're not our people. They're not Adolf's. 
His, his brother Patrick was one of the earliest African-American engravers and lithographers, very active in the abolitionist movement. How about the first black newspaper, Freedom's Journal? You ever heard of John Russwarm? John Russwarm? John Russwarm and Samuel Cornish, right uh, before the abolition of slavery in New York. Slavery was abolished July 4th, 1827 in New York. In March of that same year, 1827, Freedom's Journal was founded in New York. It's the first African-American newspaper in history. All right, the first paper. The editors were John Russwarm and Samuel Cornish. John Russwarm, all right, was from Jamaica. He's from Jamaica. <clears throat> oh, but he's not ADOS. Well, we got to get rid of him now, huh? Got to get rid of him. John Russwarm is the third black college graduate in America. Okay? He was an immigrationist. He believed that, you know, he was, uh, I guess, a colonizationist. <clears throat> okay, the, the editorial line of the paper is that blacks should consider going back to Africa. Okay, and John Russwarm did go back to Africa. In 1829, the paper folded, you know, I mean, it, it, it was trying, you know, they tried to revive it, you know, but it was, once it took that line, because black New Yorkers are black New Yorkers. They're not going back to Africa. I mean, I'm from New York. I love Africa, okay? I'm, I love Africa, that's what, but I'm a New Yorker. I'm a black New Yorker. And that's what the, the attitude that, you know, black New Yorkers took. But the paper, you know, it, 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 uh, it argued for the abolition of slavery. It was an anti-slavery paper, but it also was um, pro-colonization or, you know, blacks should return to Africa once they're freed. Most black people weren't having that, okay? Saw that paper fold. But anyway, John Russwarm. Want to get rid of John Russwarm? Huh? You want to get rid of, uh, how about we get rid of Edmonia Lewis, the sculptress? Okay, Edmonia Lewis. Look her up. These names, I don't have time to go into it. You know, I get long winded. People say, man, your videos are long, man. It's like sitting in class, you know? And, but wants to be in your video. Okay. You know? Um, yeah, we don't want to be too long tonight, but look up Edmonia Lewis, brilliant sculptress from, uh, from New York. She spent a lot of her time in Rome studying with the masters, and ultimately she passed away in England. Edmonia Lewis, Haitian father, Native American mother. All right. Uh, and it goes on and on and on. It goes on and on and on. Where do you want to stop? Where do you want to stop? Let's take it up to today. Just the other day, our beautiful sister, Cicely Tyson, passed away. Okay? What a beautiful sister. Represented our people uh, elegantly, dignified, with class and style, and immense talent. Never did anything to embarrass us, okay? Classy lady, great actress, award-winning actress, beautiful, dark-skinned, ebony-toned beauty, Cicely Tyson. No, these ADOS people, oh, she's not one of us. Her parents were from Nevis, from West Indies. She's West Indian. Thanks for the support, guys. I appreciate it. Mr. Tyler, I appreciate it, brother. Cicely Tyson. Huh? Colin Powell. Jamaica. Parents from Jamaica. Born in New York. Let's go on. Let's go on down the line. How about our culture? Now we're talking about the history. How about our culture? Um, you know what has put black folk in America on the world stage? Okay, we know we created jazz, right? But there is no greater musical form right now 
than hip hop. Hip hop is world music. You have folk rapping in Arabic, Bengali, okay? It is the dominant musical form in the world right now. And where was it born? In the South Bronx with our Jamaican West Indian brothers, Cool Herc, right? You all heard of Cool Herc, the brother who's considered the father of hip hop, right? Cool Herc was from, uh, I believe Cool Herc was from, was Cool Herc from Jamaica? Yeah, Cool Herc was from Jamaica. How about Grandmaster Flash? You ever heard of him? Grandmaster Flash in the Furious, Furious Five, Joseph Sadler, Barbados. Background is from Barbados, all right? Clive Campbell, that's my brother. That's what I'm doing. Yes, he is. Clive Campbell is, D, is DJ Cool Herc. All right. Um, we're going to say these are not our people. They're not ADOS. They're not American descendants of slaves. Okay. They're trying to make this some type of identity. All right. Separate and distinct. Like this is the real, pure American identity. Thank you, Luther. Luther Smith, my man. Like this is the, the pure American identity, black American identity, and all others are interlopers. When the truth of the matter is, we, we all benefit from the diaspora. We, we benefit from all the ingredients from wherever we come from, and it forges one American Black identity. And it's all part of our history. And you can't stop picking people off because it comes to, we are all part of this history. We are all one people. Okay, get that straight. Let's do away with, I, I don't want to hear any more about this ADOS or foundational Black Americans and all the rest of this nonsense because it's not true. The facts don't support it. It's divisive. Our culture assimilates all elements of our people, wherever they're from. And by the way, the definition is, is flawed anyway because they say you can get the reparations, you qualify legally to receive the reparations if you can trace one of your ancestors back to chattel slavery. What's the problem with that? You can have in the distant, distant past a black ancestor who was enslaved that married a white person and their children married white and their children married white such that you get to today and they're white people. They're white people with a black ancestor somewhere in the past, but all of their white, according to the definition that you advance, they would qualify to get the check. And a Louise Little would not, or her children would not. You understand? You understand? So you still will have, you'll have white people looking for black ancestors in their family tree so that they could come get this check. You got to understand that. So I'm not saying that sometimes is not a problem. I'm not saying that. I, I, I mean, we first saw this in higher education at the elite colleges and universities. This started being noticed about 15 years ago or so. It was noticed that the slots for African-Americans at the elite colleges and universities were being filled by uh, non-American Blacks, okay? Blacks with no uh, ancestry here in America. For example, the children of Nigerian professors like that, you know, the children of uh, Trinidadian business people, e elites from Black countries, their children, they were getting picked over 
American blacks. And, and I did see this myself, I must say, because when we um, aired Who Killed Malcolm X at Yale, after the presentation, after the, the showing, it was a beautiful night. We all we received, the entire team, we received a standing ovation. It was a wonderful night. And uh, <clears throat> after the event, all of my producers and directors and staff and the organizers of the event who were the students of the um, affiliated with the Black Student Union there at Yale. We went to dinner. We had a dinner, you know? And we started asking these, these young folk, you know, where are you from? You know, where, where are your people from? One brother said his, his parents were from Ghana. Another young lady said that her parents were from Egypt. Another young lady said her parents were from Dominican Republic. And it went on like this. And I noticed that, you know, none of these kids had any connection to what we would call American Blacks, you know? So that's where some of the resentment is too. We have to fix that, okay? We have to fix that, all right? Not have a big row and have some ignorant fight in the public or what have you, you know? Uh, that's a that's really more a class thing than it is anything. Okay, it's not a racial thing. It's a class thing, and we have to fix that. All right, that's that's not cool. That that you know does create resentments and what have you. But to try to make a full blown ideology out of it, okay, to try to make it something like philosophical and to create a new identity for Black people. Oh, I'm Adolf. I'm Adolf. You know. You, you heard Ice Cube use this. I'm ADOS. This, I, I developed this plan for ADOS, American descendants of slavery. Okay, as if they're more authentically black than anyone else. And I just showed that that is wrong. That is false on all accounts. So all of these blacks in our history the children of DeSabo, the children of Reason, the children of, uh, who else did I mention? Uh, John Russ Warm, all these, you know, all the families that lived through these entire generations of racial oppression, Jim Crow, segregation, lynchings, intimidation. You're gonna say they don't qualify for reparations for the sole reason that you can't point to some paper that said that somebody owned them somewhere. But yet they still experienced the terror that Louise Little experienced when the Klan was circling her house, terrorizing her and the, and the child in her womb. And it's that terror that produced Malcolm X. And that's why Malcolm X would never subscribe and co-sign this nonsense that you all are preaching to our people. It, it, it's, and people are making money off this now. They're selling ADOS t-shirts, ADOS flags. They're having conferences for ADOS. The other one, foundational black Americans. Some of them got their own flag, dividing black people up. You know, you can't, you're not part of this. You can't come in here. You're not, you're not one of us. This is for the real black American, okay? We need to talk about this during Black History Month because Carter G. Woodson would never stop cutting people out of the history. If you're of African descent and you contributed to America and you contribute, contributed to the advancement and the struggle of our people, you are our people, no matter where you come from. And this oppression and this white supremacy it forges a unified identity and peoplehood. And we are one people. So let's stop all this nonsense, ADOS, and all of that. Well, brothers and sisters, you know, I, you can see I've been thinking a lot about this. Because I'm pretty worked up about it. I didn't mean to get so excited about it. You know, I normally try to maintain my composure. But this thing has really turned hateful 
hateful and bigoted. Can you imagine? We black people are bigoted and hatred, hateful of other blacks because we think that somewhere down the line, we're going to get a reparations check, which you're probably not going to get. Let's keep that a stack. I'm not trying to rain on your parade. If you believe on that, that's cool. I, 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 you know, more power to you. All right, more power to you. I, you know, I think the arguments for reparation are sound. I think it's legitimate. I just don't think it's going to happen. It's, I don't think it's going to happen. I'm not going to stop. But when I see it turn into this, hey man. That's crazy. That's crazy. Some some black immigrant gonna come over. Listen to that. Do, do we did we ever talk like that as black people? Did we ever talk like that? Xenophobia against our own race? No. So I'm gonna close this talk out, brothers and sisters, by calling your attention to this book once again on Louise Little. This beautiful sister. You can see from the picture, she was about 20 years old in that picture. You can see why Earl Little made the move there, man. I mean, she was a little cutie pie, would you say? Yeah, she was She was a cutie pie. And um, the Littles are nice looking women. <laughs> I've got to know some of them. They, they're nice looking women, okay? They're some nice looking women. Uh, but I see where it comes from. It comes from Louise, you know? Um, she lived a long time there in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, 1963, Malcolm and Yvonne, and uh, I believe it was Filbert, they went to the Kalamazoo Mental Hospital and they took her home after about 24 years. Uh, in fact, the book was, re uh, the book was released yesterday the 31st january 31st the 82nd anniversary of louise little being taken from her family and admitted into the kalamazoo state hospital january 31st 1939 okay um if you go and watch that documentary that i shared with you Make it plain. You will see Yvonne Little talk about when she and Malcolm went and got their mother out. She lived a very long time, and I don't want to give the book away. I want you to read the book, but it goes into the history after Malcolm and her life in Grand Rapids, Michigan, with her daughter, Yvonne, and her other, sister, uh, her other daughter, Hilda. Okay, it goes into great detail. And it's very intimate, and it's a beautiful story. And uh, I like to also thank Eric McDuffie, um, young scholar who's done a lot of work on Louise Little. There are other scholars out there, and much respect to Jessica Russell in England, who wrote the book out of a labor of love. I want you all to buy the hard copy of the book. You can go and read it right now for free on Amazon Prime or Amazon, okay, Kindle. Um, Kindle is free for one month. You can download the book. Um, they, you know, they've given me, I guess, permission to say that they're not going to have a problem with you downloading the book for free. They just like you to buy the book. It's going to be very affordable. I mean, very affordable. Uh, and 25% of the book goes to a fund a charity in the name of Louise Norton Little. All right. I get nothing from it. I, I just, I just, I get nothing. I mean, I just learned about this uh, Saturday and I mean, I'm over the moon. I changed my whole subject just to talk about this book. And I, and I really had to get this whole thing off my chest. I'm glad you guys indulged me on that. Um, any support that you'd like to help the brother, if you, if you really enjoyed this talk, um, hit me up, you know, um, I have a cash app. It's there. 
if you, if you want to get in contact with me, just send me a text on Facebook. And uh, it's been my pleasure to be with you again this evening. Let's have a great Black History Month. And not just this month, but the whole year. Okay? And with that, I'm going to bring the talk to a close. Let me see, is there anything else? I don't see anything else. I don't want to be too long tonight. I hope you all enjoyed this talk, dear brothers and sisters. Uh, I'm going to see you next week, same time, 9 o'clock. Oh, the name of the title is um, Louise Norton Little. The Life of Louise Norton Little. That's what it's called, The Life of Louise Norton Little on uh, Kindle. And get it on Amazon. Okay? And just go to my Facebook page. You'll see it there as well. You can link right to it. Okay? Guys, thank you so much. Thank you, Monty. My man, I love you. I love all you guys. Thank all you guys for the support. Next week, I'm going to start reading some names. Ian Burroughs, my main man. You're really helping me out. Uh, I'm going to get it together, guys. The Life of Louise Norton Little. That's right. Go get it tonight. Read it. You're going to love it. Okay? Guys, I hope you really appreciated this talk. Uh, Margaret Fields. Hey, sister. How you doing, beloved? Guys, have a good one. I'm going to see y'all next week at the same time. All right? You have a good one. Be safe.